Hey, everybody. I think we're live. Um, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm Michael. This is Miriam. She's our Miami uh, community manager. And I think we're, we're all set. We're going to get started here in another probably 10 minutes or so. Um, there is a, another section. All right, great. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks for coming in. Um, there's a there's a section um, off to the side on the left hand side that is networking. So what you guys can do while we're getting set up, um, you can go there and you can actually FaceTime with the other attendees and stuff. Um, so we'll we'll kind of leave it up to uh, for networking for another like few minutes as more and more people come in. But yeah, thank you guys so much for coming in. We have an exciting event for you tonight and uh looking forward to it if you have any questions throughout the event just let us know um feel free to drop anything any information into the chat area introduce yourselves as you come in and uh you know we can go from there i'm gonna actually add my information here Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks guys for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. If you're just coming on again, introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, we're going to get started in the next couple of minutes. You can go to the networking section and FaceTime with other attendees for another 10 minutes. So if you want to meet some of the other attendees, you guys can go to the networking section and actually FaceTime with each other. Um, and then we're going to get started in the stage area another like five minutes or so. Okay, so Michael is here, great. All right. Um, yeah, Mike, I'm gonna send you a request to come backstage here in a second and uh, we'll test you out. Okay. There you go. Hey, well, can, you hear me? can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hey. hear you. How's it going? I'm, go I'm doing really well. How about yourself? Pretty How good. are you? Pretty good. It's quite a process getting in here. Yeah, we're uh, we're trying out this new platform um hop in it's um it's pretty interesting it's it's a little tricky to get used to but um we've been trying out a few different uh event platforms and software to see which one we like the best and um yeah this one's pretty cool because like the attendees can actually network with each other um which is what's going on over there's a tab networking over there and they can actually like facetime one-on-one -on -one with each other so um we'll kick things off here in another like few minutes there's still Looks like there's like uh, 11 people have come in so far. So we'll, we'll let some more people join and uh, come in and then we'll, we'll kick things off. But how have you been? Uh, how have you been doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Great. Just yeah. secluded at home. A lot of stuff going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually keeping pretty busy. But, good. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. Are you? Uh, so what part of Miami are you in? I am north. It's a city called Aventura. It's uh, it's like North Miami. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I spent, you... I spent some time down there actually. Yeah. So I was like, I was in Cutler Bay for like six months, and I was in Brickell oh, nice. for for a few months, and then I was actually up in like Fort Lauderdale for another like six months too. So. Oh, sweet, 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 sweet. Yeah, uh, I, I just came down here from Boston like four months ago. Okay. So I just recently relocated. I like it down here though. Okay. Wonderful. Now that the virus is killing everybody, this is a good place to be. Yeah, Miami is uh, definitely definitely a good spot for sure. Yeah, it's it's definitely weird going on. I we'll, we'll get actually get into it too a little bit of how you're going through it and how you're you know what you're doing you know to continue with your business and everything going through you know what's happening and how you're you know doing everything and operating 
remotely and, and whatnot too. Can, cool. Cool, to cool, cool, cool. Um, all right. Let me um, we'll give another couple minutes here. 6.06. Okay. Um, okay. Can you still yeah. yeah, you're back on. <laughs> I don't know what the hell happened there. Uh, you could have clicked off. Um, I think that's what I did. Yeah, I was clicking around and then booted me out. Okay. Yeah, if you clicked into the stage area, then you you exited the backstage, so it can get uh, uh, it can get tricky. Yeah, that's the one thing that's like weird about this. It's not easy to like. You know, once you click into other things, it's hard to come back on. But, yeah. um, okay, I think Miriam should be coming back in, too. I want, I want to get her introduced here. Um, you've known Miriam for some time, right? Yeah, I've known her for a little bit. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it seems like Miami's an interesting, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on in Miami um, with, you know, the, I mean, it, traditionally it's been like entertainment and real estate, but now it's it's it seems like there's some tech and, and some startup culture forming. No, for sure. I, I think it's like a big emerging hub. Is that one of the reasons why you moved down from Boston? It is, yeah. I like it down here for that. I think it's uh, the future is still not decided on here yet. So there's still a lot of diamonds in the rough, so to speak. For sure. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Okay. Um, let's see if we can get – still don't – got a request from her. Okay. Come on. And then I'm going to play a short video here. Uh, just about Entra to get everything kicked off and then we'll jump into the interview and we'll get to hear Mike's amazing story about how he started several companies. I think you, you said four, you've, you've started mm -hmm. like four companies or something. I have, yeah. Crazy. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, we'll get into, we'll get into those, his whole story, his current mm -hmm. company, everything. So, um, we're going to play a quick video here and then looking forward to kicking things off. Sweet. Second. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. All righty. Show my screen. Okay, bear with me, folks.
So if you guys haven't been to one of our events or, or anything yet, my name is Michael, I'm the CEO of Entra. We're a social network for entrepreneurs. Uh, we've built out our network mostly through events right now, and then we're getting ready to launch our app, um, which is going to be a very simple, easy way for you to connect with other entrepreneurs from your phone. So here, here's the app right here. We're, we're testing it out. It's in beta right now. Get ready to submit to the app store. Um, and it, it's really the future of work, business networking. So, um, you know, for everyone who wants to build a, a business, um, be a freelancer, start up, all of that, we're going to be able to, you know, easily connect you with developers, mentors, investors, designers, um, marketers, all, all the people that you need. Um, and you can do this in a community that supports that. I think Miriam, hey, are you are you back on? Yes, you, hey. Hey, all right, great. Um, fantastic. So I've been wanting to let you introduce yourself. Um, obviously, this event was supposed to be in Miami at Think Global, which we'll put a link uh, to that as well in, in the chat for everybody. So Think Global is a co-working space in Miami. Um, this is where we do our events at. Um, and, you know, obviously we had to switch to virtual. So I think we have people from um, a lot of different uh, cities and, and locations on here, which is great. Um, and there's, there's the link if you guys want to check out Think Global. They're one of our partners. And then I'll let Miriam share her story um, and, you know, what she's doing uh, down in Miami with us. Thanks, Michael. I really am so excited to bring the uh, Miami flavor to everyone. It's one of the benefits of, of the situation that we're all in today. So welcome, all of you. Thanks for joining. My name is Miriam. I'm the Miami Community Manager for Entra. Really excited about the uh, speaker that we have tonight, Michael Bertoff. He's got a plethora of knowledge and um, about to drop his first book, which I've gotten the inside scoop and Trust me, it's it's going to be great if you're working on your own business, trying to get your startup out there. Uh, so I'm excited for him to share some information. Definitely engage with us in the chat area here. Follow follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, all that good stuff. If you have any questions, I'm I'm happy to support and welcome. I think Michael is still here. I just, uh, hey, I just hey. myself. I was trying to get uh, Mike back in here so we can kick things off. But I think uh, everyone should hopefully be out of the networking area. And like right now, it should be closing down. Let me bring Mike Great. up. Um, there he is. I think I'm on. Hey, <laughs> awesome. All right. So. Miriam, obviously, you know, Mike, uh, you're the one who introduced us together. Hey, um, Miriam. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So um, we're going to kick things off. I think everyone, let me just make a note. Um, everyone should now be in the stage area. Okay. So we should be good. Um, Miriam, is there anything else that you want to say before I let you go and then we'll kick off the interview here? No, I think that's it. Just please engage with, uh, with us online, uh, during this time. And if you need any support and you're in Miami, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks so much, Michael, for putting together this amazing platform on network. 
thank you, Mike, for giving us your time today and sharing your knowledge with us. I'm really excited to hear what you drop on us during the next hour or so. Yeah, it's cool. gonna be great. Thank you, Miriam. And if you're if if anyone's watching in, in Miami, definitely connect with Miriam. She's a master networker. She knows a lot of people, um, and, and she'll definitely be able to connect you to the right uh, resources. Uh, so thank you, Miriam. Um, and without further ado, I think we're ready to kick things off. Okay. All right, Mike. So you have a, a very interesting background. Um, I mean, I usually like to let the speakers share their background or just a quick, you know, who they are, you know, and their story really quickly before we jump into it. Cause I think it's best coming out of the person's mouth themselves rather than me trying to introduce you in the, in the proper way. So if you can, um, just fill everyone in on, you know, who you are and your background and, you know, where you come from and everything. Sure. Um, so, hey, everyone, my name is Michael Bertov. I am the founder and CEO of GeoOrbital. I'm also the vice chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum, where I'm also an innovation instructor. Um, I've been doing uh, my car and company for about six years, and I've been teaching um, at the Enterprise Forum for about four years. Uh, before that, I've also lectured in other universities around the Boston area. Um, so I've been doing startups for a while. This is my fourth company now. I've had three companies before then. Um, they've all, they've ranged from software companies, enterprise software, to services companies, financial. I started, I co-founded a hedge fund. That was actually my first company. Um, and, you know, just the regular things that you would associate with startups. I, I uh, founded a local search engine when that was kind of cool. That's before Google really got into uh, local. Yeah. Uh, that was a little while ago. Um, and yeah, my, my previous company is operating. It's successful. Um, and my current company is operating as well. It's also successful. So in, in total, I've raised probably close to, I don't know, 15 million in funding from investors and such. Um, if you don't count the hedge fund, for the hedge fund, I actually helped raise around $200 million. Uh, but that was um, that was a very different thing than this. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's me in a nutshell. I've been at it for a long time. Uh, I have a lot of, I guess, insights. I've been probably jaded more than most people have, especially if you're young to this. So I'll take it from there. If you have any questions, I'm going to be very honest and brutal with my answers. Fantastic. That's what we like to hear. Uh, so yeah, throughout the interview, guys uh, and girls, put your questions in the comments and we'll make sure that we get to them at the end. Um, we'll also be doing some different pools and stuff towards the end, but um, yes. So, yeah, I mean, incredibly impressive background. 15 years you've been on Shark Tank, you've been on Harvard, MIT, you know, all, all of these crazy things. So what made you, let's go back to the beginning, like what made you want to be an entrepreneur? How did you get started and why did you start uh, this journey? And was it like, did you fall into it? Did you like always know that you were going to be an entrepreneur? Take us back to like. It's a good question. I think it's it's either you are or you aren't. I think you know that from a very early age. Um, so I have always had kind of an entrepreneurial vibe to me. Um, I helped uh, before I journeyed out on my own. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Republic of Kazakhstan. And I helped a lot of small businesses get off the ground. So I wrote a lot of grants. I, I started a bunch of non-governmental organizations or helped others do that as well. So I kind of got the bug um, and the skill set. So it kind of made me go into my comfort zone a little bit. Um, and I did international development for a number of years after that as well. I worked for Bill Clinton and a bunch of foundations uh, traveling the world, helping people start small companies. Um, after that, I was actually, I came back to the States. I got a good offer uh, to work for an investment bank for UBS, which is one of the largest banks. Um, and I traded credit derivatives on Wall Street for a number of years, mm. uh, yeah. which is very opposite of doing international development. But I like to call it, you know, balancing out my karma. Uh, <laughs> you know, became yeah. a pretty balanced guy after that. Um, so in, in 2008, it was, it was a very interesting thing that happened. Um, you know, we had, we had a massive uh, event, not unlike the event that's happening now, uh, that caused a lot of really high quality people to lose their opportunity cost, as in people got laid off, 
people switched, priorities changed. There was just a massive cultural shift. Um, and I was part of that. I was in the trading floor of a big Swiss bank, UBS at the time. And I got laid off and I said, well, why the fuck not? I'm going to start a fund. Uh, I had a bunch of connections at the time and that was my first company that I started. Um, so I, I, I got into entrepreneurship because of a global cataclysm. Um, and I would actually think that what's happening right now is going to do that as well. Um, it's a very different flavor to what's happening right now, but I think this is a renaissance for startups. This is all this, all the innovation stuff that you see around the world came out of 2008. All of the big companies now came out of 2008. Yeah. You look um, at Uber, Airbnb, they yeah. were all 2008. Yeah. Even around. companies that were founded before, they grew out of 2008. Amazon owes its success to 2008. Um, pretty much any successful company that you would assume or you would term disruptive uh, came out of 2008. Yeah. Um, whether it's robotics, biotech, yeah, sharing economy, apps, uh, retail innovation, anything, pretty much everything that you see now in the big innovation centers in Silicon Valley and Boston, New York, they all were born in 2008, or at least they grew a lot in 2008. Um, so sure. in 2020 is going to be the same thing. So whatever happens, this is a very exciting time for startups. Interesting. I totally agree. Um, one of the reasons why you know we're doing what we're doing too, and one of the reasons why we believe it's so valuable is because we want to help all these entrepreneurs like start these companies and build these businesses during these hard times, and giving people an outlet to network and meet meet like-minded people and come together. So entrepreneurship's not such a lonely and like mysterious thing. Um, we can you know we can really bring everyone together, but. I totally agree with you in, in the fact that like, you know, these hard times is what really it's opportunity. Like this is where everything comes from. Um, so how did you go about, I mean, this is an interesting, you know, segue too, and we can talk about this. Um, like when you started your, this first company, which was the hedge fund, um, I'm sure there's some people obviously, you know, maybe not so much interested in investing in hedge funds, but I think it's interesting and a good perspective for people to have if they plan on raising money and talking to investors. How did you go about like setting it up? I know you mentioned that you worked for UBS, so you had connections in the space. Um, but how did you like set it up and then convince people to, you know, put in this, this first, the first 200 million um, to make it, you know, go you know make it become anything in that hard time you know you had to you know you had to come with some you know probably big um ideas or you know i don't know how how difficult that was talking to investors at that time but i'm sure it wasn't easy coming out of that that crisis yeah, i mean 2008 was a, a unique time um definitely uh I, the fundraising for a fund is mostly it's more like fundraising for a housing development. It's really not uh, like it is fundraising for startups. When you're trying to raise capital for a startup, the the profile of the investor is entirely different. Um, the risk profile of that investment is completely different. Um, so I can talk about raising money for relatively safe things like a fund, uh, like a hedge fund, uh, versus raising money for something crazy risky like a startup. Um, I actually have had much less success with raising for startups. Raising for startups is much more difficult. Um, and it's it's also less predictable. There's no um, there's no formula, right? There, you'll never, the goalpost is always changing. It's always moving further away. Um, so there's no, there's nothing you can do to make your company fundable. Whereas um, in you know something like real estate or whatever, there's very easy things you can do and be able to raise money. Uh, there's a goal that you can set, and if you meet it, you can get some cash. For a startup, that's never the case. Uh, so right. it, it really is an entirely different experience raising money for startups. Um, and you know, I, after the fun, I've actually done very crazy, off the wall types of things, um, and they, they've always been very difficult to raise for. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that, that probably addresses your question kind of in a roundabout way. But as far yeah. as... For um, sure. Well, I, I definitely yeah. want to get into startup investing and stuff too. I was that, I was curious about your approach with um, tackling, just because the timing right now 
it's I mean, it's it's similar in a way to 2008, but like it's also different. How did you maybe I'll phrase it a little bit differently in the sense because I definitely want to get into the talking to investors and stuff for startups. But how did you instead of like raising money for the fund in 2008 and doing all that? What was your mindset in 2008 as like all this stuff is collapsing and whatnot? And you're like, hey, I'm going to I left my I got, you know, got you know, fired from my job, but I'm going to start something new. Like what was your mindset for that? And like what what made you want to do that in that time frame and not just look for another job? And maybe give some people um, maybe some tips or advice um, on what you did to 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 start it during that time that might be applicable to, uh, to the current situation going on right now too. Well, I mean, there was no other job. Um, mm. it, it was very easy. The decision to become entrepreneurial was very easy. Um, there's just nothing else to do. So the, and that, that's, that's what I mean. That, that's kind of what's happening now. It's not happening in the same industry sectors as happened in 2008. So yep. very different types of people are becoming available now. Um, yep. If you look at, um, if you look at 2008 and now, we, we're actually seeing a very, very similar trend. In 2008, what happened when the economy crashed uh, because of housing values and mortgage-backed securities and things like that, uh, what you saw is a lot of sophisticated investors putting money into the markets. They're just putting them into different assets. Um, what you saw was a lot of retail investors, the not sophisticated guys, pulling money out. So that, that guy with the 401k or that whatever, just a regular Joe Schmo with an E-Trade account, gets nervous and pulls money out of the market, making the market lose value. And those guys make up a significant amount of the market. Uh, while yep. the sophisticated guys realize this and they actually put money into the market. I think it was Vanderbilt or one of the old founding yep. fathers of the U.S. Uh, said that the best time to invest in is when there's blood in the streets. Sure. Uh, and that's very true. Um, so in 2008... If you found the right profile of investor, you can get investment. Uh, and in fact, the fund uh, that I started was focused exactly on that type of asset class. We were making money off. Well, the, we, it was difficult. We didn't actually launch the fund because that 200 million that I raised wasn't enough to launch it. Um, as funny as it is, but we're just talking about very different scope uh, than startup stuff. Um, so we spent about a year raising that cash and we did raise it, but we never actually launched the fund and we refunded everybody. Uh, but what, what we were doing, the intent was to actually make money off of the fa falling values of real estate um, in, in, a, in a complicated way. So right now what you see, and you see a very uh, clear trend right now as well, is that if you look at the world of equity crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding yep. is that mechanism that allows regular people, non-accredited investors, to invest in a startup. Um, yep. the, all of the platforms are reporting, reporting record numbers of investments. Uh, it's sure. It's that right now in the last two, three weeks, uh, the platforms are having the best weeks of their life. And these platforms have been mm -hmm. around for four or five years. So you actually see a massive increase in startup investing because on some part, you have all these guys pulling money out of the public markets and putting them yep. into the private ones. And yep. we have a lot of historical data that shows that startups are very, very recession proof. Uh, and in fact, startup valuations tend to rise during recessions, while pu big pump public company valuations tend to fall. So actually, right now, it's a very different dynamic, uh, raising money, um, not only because, um, you know, there's insecurity, but also because the processes that traditional investors use are being disrupted right now. For example, there's no more angel group meetings right now, right? Because nobody's meeting anymore. So you can't yeah. pitch to an angel group and get your check. Uh, right. VC are not doing diligence right now because a big part of their diligence is getting to know you and having coffee with you and hanging out with you. So they can't do that because they can't leave their house. So the entire process is being disrupted. But as far as the capital that's available, it's actually more now uh, from all indications than it was even a month ago. So coronavirus is helping startups in a huge way by becoming cap by making capital available to them and making uh, the private asset class, investing in startups, attractive to investors. Interesting. See, that that's a very interesting perspective because from what I, I've seen and like kind of just what I, I've gathered so far, it seems like a lot of, and I think you're definitely right as far as like the early stage stuff and especially the, the equity crowdfunding. I know I believe you you use Kickstarter, so not necessarily equity crowdfunding, but a, a crowdfunding 
uh, platform nonetheless, right? I think you raised over a million dollars or something on Kickstarter, right? I've done both. Uh, so I've raised over a million on Kickstarter and I've raised over a million in equity crowdfunding. I've raised literally millions of dollars across all types awesome. of crowdfundings. What yeah. platform did you use? Did you use WeFunder, Start Engine? Start Engine for my equity raises. Yeah, I had two uh, raises on Start Engine. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we've been, like, even for us, we've been very interested in doing an equity crowdfunding round. We've just been waiting for our app to come out because we really want to kind of like use it almost as a marketing campaign as well. And I think if you do it in the correct way, you can actually get a ton of publicity and marketing from doing these equity crowdfunding campaigns because the platforms themselves will promote you too. So I'd love to, maybe we can dive into this as well. What are your thoughts on uh, someone who's building a company right now, like they're, they're at the early stage, they, they might be struggling for capital or they're, they're, they're slowly losing capital or they're just starting. They have no investors yet. Would you recommend them, you know, uh, maybe go to uh, do a friends and family round, do an accelerator, do an equity crowdfunding campaign? What are your thoughts on on kind of these different options for people who are at the beginning stages? What would you what would you recommend? Well, I mean, it's whatever is the, the lowest hanging fruit for you. So if you have rich friends and family, take their money. Uh, if you know a <laughs> bunch of angels, take their money. If you have friends that work at a bank and they're going to give you a good loan, take their money. If you have 100 grand in savings, use that money. It's whatever the lowest hanging fruit is. There's really no formula. The, the problem with friends and family, and this is a problem that you see with a lot of, um, it's it's a very common thing in the startup world that people will talk about having your first round come from friends and family. A lot of friends and family don't have wealth. So for rich people, friends and family are a good option. Uh, but yeah, it's absolutely. definitely not accessible to a lot of folks. So yeah. I, I don't think friends and family is the automatic first step. And I actually think it's extremely disingenuous of the VC and angel to promote that as the first step in a fundraise. The reason they yeah. do that is actually not for capitalization. Um, the reason they do that is something called social collateralization. So I'm going to digress yep. a little bit because I have a personal kind of a pet peeve with the friends and family thing. Um, okay. Let's hear it. The idea for friends and family funding rounds actually came out in the 19th. Um, it's based on, so this might be kind of lost in the literature now, but if you're familiar with the world of microfinance, there was a very prominent banker named Muhammad Yunus who ran Grameen Bank uh, in Bangladesh. So microfinance is the idea of giving very small loans or uh, for repayment, for profit, uh, very small loans, $5, $10, $50, a couple of hundred dollars maybe, uh, to help start micro businesses. So maybe some impoverished area with some minority group. They need $50 to buy some inventory so they can go and sell it. And then from there, they'll have a business. Now, the challenge with giving out a $50 loan or a $100 loan to somebody who's got nothing uh, is that they don't have any collateral over it. So you don't have a house they can put up. They don't have a car. Um, they, they can't, you know, they, there's literally nothing they have. And the United Nations also finds it extremely unethical to make somebody give up their housing uh, in order to collateralize a loan. So... The whole industry of microfinance was based on this high risk kind of scenario. How do you collateralize something for people that have absolutely no assets? So Muhammad mm -hmm. Yunus and, and a team of various people working at the same time came up with the idea that they called social collateralization. That's basically the idea of embarrassing somebody in front of their peer group if they don't repay the loan. So you take their network connections, their friends and family, and you use them as collateral. So if somebody defaults on a loan, you go out to your friends and family or to their friends and family, to the lender's friends and family, uh, to the loanees, and you embarrass that person. You say that person didn't repay the loan. That person is a liar. That person shouldn't be trusted. Things like that. So that turned out, as you can imagine, to be extremely effective, um, especially in countries outside of the United States, outside of the Western world, people's reputation is extremely valuable to them. It's actually not as valuable to us here, but that's a completely different thing. Uh, here, people are perfectly fine to lie and cheat and steal. But a lot of the places in the developing world, that's actually not the case. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because of network effects and communication and because you generally die in the same village you grew up in. So the cost of uh, screwing over your friends and family is much higher. But anyway, right. the, the 
story. So the yeah. idea of socially collateralizing loans became very prominent, very successful. So this idea was adopted by early stage venture capitalists uh, and angels, because at the early stages of a startup, there's really nothing that a startup can put up for collateral, kind of like that impoverished person in the developing world. So how do right. you collateralize a loan? Like what, if, you, if I give, if I was an angel and I gave a hundred grand to somebody, how the hell do I know they're not just going to run off with it? Yeah. Right. How the hell do I know they're not just going to lie to me and take that money? And uh, there's a huge risk. They have nothing to put up in exchange of it. I'm not going to sue them. They have nothing to pay. Right. They're just right. going to take my money and run away with it. So the, right. the same concept kind of became into effect. So if you take money from your friends and family and you screw them over by making your company fail or running away, you have more skin in the game. So by taking money from friends and family before you take your first professional round of funding is a way for the first professional funders to collateralize their investment. They don't, they don't want you to embarrass your friends and family. They don't want you to be embarrassed in front of them. They mm. want them to put money into your company. Um, so anyway, this has got twisted and evolved over the years, but that's the basic yeah. idea. And eventually now I've actually worked with companies at one company in China that yes. that told me that their investors, their angel investors, requested naked photographs of the founding team, and if the founding wow. team defaulted on that investment, they would show the naked photographs to friends and family members of the founding team. So that's extreme. it's extreme, but, but that's not it's not right. here. Uh, it it works. Uh, that doesn't happen here because of other legal issues. But uh, what does happen here is actually really similar. So when somebody says, "Raise your friends and family round." Um, what they're actually asking for is collateral. They want to make sure that um, they don't, they, the money's nice, but the, what they're asking for more is uh, how do I get, how do you guarantee that you're not just going to run away with the cash I'm going to invest in you? Right. Gotcha. That, that's an interesting, I, I have never heard that perspective before. Um, I've heard investors talk about how it's important for, for some investors, it's important for them to show that the founders can raise some money, even five, 10, 15, whatever, thousand dollars, you know, just from people that they know and from their own network before they take on like 100, 200, you know, millions. Um, they wanna see that, you know, you can at least get money from, you know, someone, you know, in, in from your circle so that it shows you have at least uh, a good reputation, people will trust you, et cetera. So, I, yeah, that's uh, that's true, but it's the yeah. flip of that. It's the flip it's side of that. Uh, they but, want to but, sure that, yeah, it's but also like a, it's almost like a security in a way. It is. Uh, it's securitizing yeah. your investment, but there's also kind of an uglier side to that assumption. So by saying that, go raise ten, twenty grand from your family members uh, before you pitch to me, kind of has a different genesis as well. If you so there is the concept of an accredited investor in the United States. Um, an accredited investor is effectively a millionaire, somebody who's got a net worth of over a million bucks. Um, in the 1930s, they made some laws, the SEC, the federal agency that's responsible for protecting investors. Uh, they passed some laws saying that only accredited investors can invest in startups. Only millionaires can invest in startups. Right. Yep. And everybody who's ever raised money, you know that they have to be accredited and things like that. So it's a right. law. It was passed in the 1930s and it really has been it's been edited a few times, but effectively only millionaires can invest in startups. So let's right. look into that prohibition. So just to just to reiterate, millionaires in this country are responsible for funding innovation, right, for funding disruption. Yep. So let's look demographically at who millionaires are. Millionaires, on average, are 62-year-old white men. Yep. Right? No, I just, I mean, it's not, I'm not saying anything controversial. Yeah. It's just statistics, right? Yeah. So if you look at the yeah. average millionaire, the vast majority, well over 80% of them, will be in that age range of 62, white and male. Now, it's ironic that 62-year-old white men are responsible for funding innovation, right? Because you would just assume that that's the type of person responsible for keeping the status quo. Right. That's the person against innovation. But it also but outside of that, it's also interesting that um, the, those people are also surrounded in their networks by people who have 20 grand. They're surrounded in their networks by people who have 50 grand, 100 grand, 500 grand, millions of dollars. So when they talk to other founders, their assumption is the same. 
that their friends and family have 20 grand to invest. And that is an extremely dangerous assumption. So by, right. by limiting who you invest in, by saying you need to raise your friends and family around, you're already demographically limiting the kind of people you invest in. You're also going to invest in white men. And that is yeah. very common, the truth. And then if you look at statistics about who's getting investment, about 97% of the founding teams that are invested in are made up of uh, white men. And it's, it's a very dangerous thing. And it's, it is structural because th there are laws making this the case. But yeah. it's also very challenging for minority and female founders to, to fund companies sure. through these traditional investment sources. Um, so, yeah, this friends and family thing is a symptom of a much larger issue. But anytime you hear an investor say raise money from a friends and family, uh, it's important to keep in mind that that has a pretty dark history and a pretty sure. dark logic behind that request. Yeah. I mean, we've had uh, we've had, you know, investors at our events saying, you know, family and friends are the worst investors to take money from, worst people to take money from. Like, you know, you should avoid it. You know, there's there's different angles to it. But um yeah, I think I've also, you know, seen a lot of the same things that you're talking about. I think everything that you're saying is 100 percent accurate. Um, and what we're starting to see is this open opening up with the equity crowdfunding and letting other people invest. So you get much more diversity. You get different ideas, different thoughts in, in these companies and different people on board with them um, as well. So I think um, if we can continue to you know, do that and continue to make like early stage investing and startup investing accessible to more people that really care about, you know, certain companies. I think that's just going to help the startup ecosystem as a whole much, much better. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is where, it, you know, this is where it's at. So um, this is, I, I, I wasn't really expecting to get this, this into this, but it's a, it's a very interesting topic that I think um, everyone, you know, it should be, you know, hearing and, and this is really good information. What about uh, talking to investors? So when you first, you know, raised, um, you know, th this money or the first time from, from the first time you started raising money um, uh, for your businesses to what you know now, what would you do differently talking to investors? What are your tips, advice for people who are talking to investors for the first time or, you know, just getting things rolling? What have you learned over the years of working with investors and talking to investors and raising money? I mean, every it, at this super early stage, um, every investor you talk to has different motivation to invest. Yeah. Um, so if you're raising, let's say, your first million bucks, maybe your first couple of million bucks, the investors, they want ROI, but they also have a lot of other motivation. It really depends on the person you're talking to. Um, it's about being genuine. Realistically, if it's a traditional investor like an angel or a VC, and by the way, I say traditional because there's many other types of investors, uh, but we're pro I think we're primarily talking about angels and venture capitalists. Um, you have to understand, and I kind of alluded to this earlier when I was talking about the demographics of these people, uh, that these are older white guys. Older white guys tend to be comfortable with other white guys. Statistically, they're more comfortable with young, attractive white guys. So if you're a young, attractive white guy, and actually Harvard Business School did a good study on this, you have a much better chance of raising money from them than if you're part of a group, of a minority group. And a lot of that, I, they, they, they went into a lot of psychological reasons behind that, but they kind of see that person as a kind of a protege, somebody they can mentor, somebody that's just like mm -hmm. them. So it's an idealized version of who they think they were when they were at that age. Different story, but demographically, it's actually really important to realize uh, who you're talking to, and their comfort level. Now, it's not that these guys are racist or sexist or anything like that. It's just that their process for investing is relationship building. Uh, so the due diligence process for an early stage investment is very heavily building a relationship, getting to know you. Can I have coffee with this person? Do we like the same yeah. sports teams? Do we have the same hobbies? Do we watch the same TV shows? And if I like him, my my spidey sense tells me that I should be investing in them. And as silly as it is, that is the diligence process at the super early stage. Because again, the company doesn't really have anything to show for itself. There's no financials. There's no anything, right? You're super early. So the only, right. the only criteria the investor has is, do I like this person? So I think mm. from, my, from my experience is anytime you go pitch 
anytime you go meet an investor, your goal isn't to make a sale. Your goal is to make a friend. Um, mm. Whether you're pitching to a group or to an individual, there's no nobody leaves that meeting with a sale. Yeah, you can only leave it with a friend. And if it's a if it's a group of angels, that friend is going to sell you to the other angels in that group. If it's an individual, that friend is going to be the one investing in you. But yeah, I think that the the biggest challenge I've seen startup founders make is approaching this like it's a sale situation where it's not. Um, it's a friend situation. Hey, let's hang out and get drinks kind of situation. Um, mm -hmm. Additionally, when you are presenting the company, the biggest mistake I've ever seen a founder make to traditional investors is presenting a viable business. And this this seems ironic, but uh, but presenting a business that is cash flow positive and profitable is actually a super bad thing for these guys. Um, and that has to do with structurally how money is invested in your company. So a traditional investor in Angel or VC, they, there's only, let's say I give you, I'm one of those guys, let's say hypothetically, and I give you a hundred bucks. Uh, there's only three scenarios will I ever see any money from you ever again. Uh, scenario number one is if you go public, you become publicly traded. Um, then I will get rewarded for that. That's super rare. It almost never happens. Let's forget that scenario. Uh, the other scenario is you sell yourself to a larger company. Then I make a multiple of what I invested in you. That's a great scenario. I want those. Those are also very rare. Most companies do not sell themselves to other companies. And the third scenario is you go out of business and I take a tax write-off. There's literally no other way for an investor to get their money out of the company. There's structurally no other way. Uh, when someone, when an investor gives you a hundred dollars, that's there's only three. One of those three scenarios needs to happen for them to see any money from you ever again. Now, it's important to realize that if you present a viable business that is profitable, that is operational, that is good, that's bad for the investor because the investor doesn't care about you making money, about your business doing well. There's no way for them to profit from it. The investor is valuing two things. The investor is valuing your ability to sell your company or your ability to fail quickly and go out of business. Those are in practice the only two scenarios that they have. Now, obviously they prefer for you to sell, but for you to sell, it's not your revenue that people are buying. The people that are buying you have much more revenue than you would ever have. So what do they buy? They don't care about your revenue. They don't give a shit about your revenue. What they care about is your users. So what they want is for people to chase market share, not revenue. So when you're modeling your financials, you should be showing a hockey stick curve, not on cash, but on users, on market adoption. That is the criteria that investors value companies on. Um, you look at Uber, you look at Tesla, you look at any of those big companies, they don't have any profits. They're, they lose billions of dollars every single quarter, but they are winning and they're worth billions of dollars in valuation because they get more and more market share every single time. Um, mm -hmm. investors, traditional investors, and I'm not, I'm again, I'm only talking about angels and VCs. Other investors have yep. other motivations. Uh, angels and VCs don't care about you being happy about your business being fundamentally sound. Um, if your business is fundamentally sound and it's not on its way to an exit or a bankruptcy, there's actually an industry term for it. They call it a zombie company. Um, yep. a zombie is somebody who kind of goes along and doesn't die. Uh, and they will do everything they can to make you die. They love killing zombies. Yep. Because, again, that's the only yeah. way they'll ever get their money back, right, structurally. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they don't want to be a zombie. You don't want to model a zombie business. And a zombie business can be a very profitable business. It doesn't matter. Uh, what you want to model is a business that's going to take a lot of market share. And the business's competitors or strategic partners will want to acquire that business in order to get some of those users so they can monetize them in other ways. Um, companies get acquired primarily for users. Um, in, the, in the software world, yeah. In the uh, in other worlds, they get acquired for IP and other reasons like that. For the for the most part, they get acquired for customers, not for revenue. Right. Yeah, I, this is fantastic. I mean, I think you're you're spot on. I love this. Um, you're uh, you, you clearly know what you're talking about. Um, I tell you know I, I explain to people too. You know, from from our perspective, like in building out this network of entrepreneurs, we're we're, we're our approach is exactly what you're talking about. Right now, there's so many entrepreneurs out there in the world, and it's growing at a ridiculous rate and freelancing and all this stuff. Um, so our whole thing is like, let's connect all of them and let's build this platform where they can all interact together. Um, you know what I mean? And 
it's not so much, yeah, obviously, like we want to make money with it, but we know that if we build the largest network of entrepreneurs in the world and have all of these users on our platform and we control the platform, we will be able to do a, a, a many different things. Like there, there's endless things that we can do with that um, and opportunity that we can do with that as well. Um, like you're saying with the users and I, it's kind of like this thing, you know, a lot of people talk about attention is the new currency, right? If you can get people's attention and I kind of frame it, if you can get people to do stuff for free, like if you can get people to do stuff, even for free, you can make a boatload of money on it. Right. And, and that is a really powerful thing that I don't think a lot of people are understand when they're starting out. But at the same time, a lot of early stage investors are like, where's the revenue? Where's the revenue? Where's the revenue? And um, that also you know, gets put on all these founders uh, when they're starting out to like figure out ways to monetize. But the real investors and the big investors, they, in my opinion, they, they see it how you how you would just explain it, which I thought was fantastic. Um, so I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts now if we can. If there's anything else that you want to add to that, um, but um, I want to get your thoughts next on hiring and building a team, because I think this is also really, really critical for people to understand. Um, when they're starting a company, they might be a solo founder or whatever, but you need other people um, to build anything of, of magnitude. Um, so how, um, if you want to add anything to the investing piece, go ahead. And then how did you go about building your team, co-founders? How do you recommend people getting co-founders and building their team? Let me add a little uh, uh, segment sure. about uh, banding entrepreneurs together, which is what you're doing. Um, yeah. Have you ever heard of a platform called thefunded.com? The Funded. The Funded. Their, their, their website is still online. I recommend everybody here to not listen to me talk and just go to their website right now. But um, So The Funded has a very interesting history. Uh, in 2012, um, when this is the same year that uh, Yelp came out, uh, yep. An entrepreneur thought, well, Yelp reviews product services. Uh, I'm going to make a Yelp for VC, for investors. So this is a mm. platform that came out in 2012 um, that allowed entrepreneurs to review their investors uh, and other sources of capital and support for startups. Uh, again, 2012, the, uh, the, started by a founder that got burned by his VC. Um, so he gotcha. founded this platform. It blew up. Uh, it was founded in Silicon Valley by somebody who was definitely on the inside of, of the entrepreneurship space. Uh, very prominent entrepreneur, had a lot of connections. This thing blew up. Uh, Thefunded.com. You should, you sh everybody should visit it yeah. now. Uh, within a few months, uh, it had collected hundreds of thousands of reviews from jaded entrepreneurs, from happy entrepreneurs, and it became the largest entrepreneurial community ever. Um, and at the same exact time, they started getting cease and desist letters from venture capitalists. They started getting sued daily. Many times a week, they started getting sued. Uh, there's actually a Wikipedia article, which is, makes a nice read, unless that VC keep taking down, apparently. But that's a different story. So every time that, and that's just one example, every time that entrepreneurs have tried to band together, um, the venture capitalists have sued them and shut them the fuck down. And right now, the only place that you have a community of entrepreneurs is inside of portals that are run by accelerators and incubators. So, for example, right. Techstars and Y Combinator and all those guys, uh, they have portals inside where entrepreneurs can talk to each other. Now, it's funny because those portals are censored. They actually have administrators that remove and uh, that remove users and remove statements. Um, but it's also those funds, those accelerators are funds. They're run by venture capitalists. And a lot of people don't understand that Techstars is not an accelerator. It's a seed fund. Um, yep. They take a lot of equity from a company to let them into this fund. And they do diligence on you for three months uh, to decide if you're going to be eligible for the next round. All of these for-profit accelerators are not there to accelerate any companies. They're there to evaluate investments. They're farms. That's what the VC have gotten together and decided to do now that they're exiting early stage investing with checks yep. because it's too risky. Yep. Now they're taking early stage hostages by making these venture capital 
uh, accelerators. Yep. So yeah, and the only platforms that you have that allow people to co uh, to communicate with each other is inside of these portals. Um, right. And it's fascinating. But every time that has been something independent has been started, like what you're doing, it's been shut down. So I would assume yep. that as soon as you get critical mass, um, you're going to get pushed back from VC, a lot of it, uh, just because traditionally that's been the case. Um, so I think the goal here is to get a lot of critical mass immediately uh, so yep. that the VC look bad for shitting on you. But then again, the VC wow. industry is also much weaker now than it was in 2012 as well. They've been beaten up yeah. a lot from a lot of different sides, um, including the U.S. government. The U.S. government has come down regularly on the venture capital industry saying that they're uh, – that they're bad, and they are. They're very bad for the innovation economy. Um, but anyway, that's that's my segue about uh, unionizing entrepreneurs. It's I love it. I know a yeah. few times it's uh, people didn't like it. I'll put it that way. Yeah. But uh, as far as hiring, uh, your other question, I, I yeah, I mean, in the early stages, again, it depends on I guess the stage of company we're talking about. If you're just starting out, and again, I like just just for clarity, I'd, I'd you know, just generally, it's, let's let's say it's before your your first two million dollar raise, right? So, like, let's say you're going after VC or angels or whoever the fuck, and you're trying to raise under two million bucks. I'll, I'll talk about that stage of company, right? So, what how define that however you want. Uh, right. So, I think in that stage of company, the most critical employees are the ones whose interests are aligned with your interests. So I'll, I'll put it this way. So the traditional, if you look to, if you go to a VC or angel panel or something like that, they'll always talk about, you know, raise money from, from us, from raise money from us and use it to hire people. Now, let's, yeah. let's say you do that, right? Let's say you give 5% of your equity, hypothetically, I'm just making up numbers, uh, to a VC. The VC gives you a hundred grand. You use that hundred grand to hire a developer. Okay. That's a, that's the process that is being advertised. So the VC in this case, or the angel is the middleman. In this process, you give your five percent to this middleman. The middleman gives you a hundred grand. You take this hundred grand. You take it. You give it to a developer. Okay, that's the process that's currently marketed as the default process. Now, yep. I don't think you need the middleman. Uh, an early stage company should always skip the middleman. Middlemen are expensive. They take a lot of control. Um, there's a lot of issues with taking money from these traditional investors, which I'm not going to go into, but believe me, it's not really good money to take. And I think the more experienced an entrepreneur gets, the more they realize that. So if you talk to an experienced entrepreneur with a few companies under their belt, they'll almost always tell you that is, that is horrible money to take. Uh, that's probably the most expensive money to take, and it's got all these problems with it. Um, but anyway, that, that's beside the point. But the... So the best employee, I think, is the one that you can give that 5% to and will work for you, will work for your vision. Mm -hmm. Their incentive is aligned with yours. Um, that employee is harder to find than a hundred grand employee, but that is a much better employee for you. And that employee is much easier to find than an angel investor. So it's a more valuable employee for the company, somebody who will take equity. Uh, it's a harder employee to find because realistically they need money to live on without being paid by you, uh, at least not immediately. Uh, so it is harder employee to find, but it is a much better employee for your company because they want to have your company succeed uh, like you do as a founder rather than taking their hundred grand uh, throughout the year and then fucking off. So for sure, it's a, so that as far as hiring, it's that. So, you, I mean, you obviously have to like the person. You're going to spend a lot of time with them, but it's yeah. also somebody who 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 wants to be part of the company, uh, who who sees the vision, who shares your passion. Um, that's also bad. I mean, the people who share passions get passionate, and passionate people disagree with each other. Founders break up right. all the time, and it gets super ugly. You can't like take equity back once it's been issued. So there's a lot of there's a lot of cost yeah. to it. But honestly, it's yeah. still better than breaking up with your VC than with your angel investor. Yeah. Uh, so breaking up with your co-founder is is painful, but it's much less painful than having a breakup with your angel who will just force you out of business. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, you got to keep take your ego out of it a little bit. I think when you're hiring, um, I think as a general rule, I always try to hire my boss. Uh, anytime I hire anybody, they need to know more about whatever it is that they're doing than I do. Otherwise, what the hell's the point of hiring them? At least at the early stage. So if I can imagine this person, me serving under this person in wh whatever the role I'm hiring them for, if I'm hiring a salesperson, I would want them to know far more about sales than I know. 
uh, I would want them to tell me what to do and I'd be struck in awe about how awesome that is. Uh, same as developers or any 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 job that I hire for super early stage. Um, gotcha. So I think it's always important to hire your boss. Um, that's, that's always what I try to do. Um, somebody you like, somebody you respect, somebody you spend a lot of time with. Um, so I think that's what it is. But it also depends on who's available to you. Um, and you have to be good at it. You have to be good at selling the vision of the company uh, in order to attract those people. But you have to be good at selling the vision of the company in order to attract investors too. So as far as the skill set that an early stage CEO has, uh, it's far more about selling the future of the company than it is about selling the products of the company. Um, that brings in much more uh, resources to your organization. Yeah, I think inspiring people, like you know, just getting people on board with the mission of what you're building, extremely important. Um, for us, most of all the people who are involved with Entra have you know have some equity and are, are involved with it on that level. Um, have you, for your businesses, have you uh, brought in? Like, have you gotten, did you start it with co-founders or did you just bring on early employees and give them equity? Um, and do you recommend people find co-founders like before they start it, um, you know, just so that they can, you know, build it from scratch with somebody? Or do you think if they can't and there's not an easy way for them to do it, they should continue to start it themselves and then maybe try to hire people as employees but maybe give them some equity as well what are your thoughts between like the co-founder dynamic and then like employee you know versus a co-founder i think it, it depends on your personality um in general i think some people just can't share uh their, their company with others i think i've seen that a lot um yep. there was a um, there was an article um also harvard article uh, that kind of coined a question in the startup world that you actually get here uh, repeated a lot. Um, the question is, do you want to be rich or do you want to be king? And that's a question that every early stage CEO kind of needs to answer for themselves. Uh, the people who are in it for the money, the people who genuinely want to exit and get a bunch of cash, I think they would consider more likely to consider bringing on people. Because you know, sharing half of Google is better than having a hundred percent of nothing. Um, so they would, I think, those people are much more likely to bring in founders. The ones who want to be kings, uh, and there's a lot of king founders, and there's nothing wrong with that. The king is controls everything. It's their vision. It's their baby. Um, it's their everything. I think those those that type of persona is less likely to be able to attract um, to be able to attract and to be to be happy with a co-founder. Um, so it really is kind of like a marriage. It really is kind of like a relationship. A lot of things can go wrong, and it's not for everyone. Um, some people are better in relationships. Some people are worse in them. Uh, so I can't, I can't say that there's a rule for it about whether to bring in a co-founder. And also just the term co-founder is kind of an iffy term. Like, what the hell is really a co-founder? Um, you know, if, if somebody starts a company with you from scratch, yeah, I guess they're a co-founder, but... Generally, a company is the initiative of a person. Um, it's somebody's brainchild, and then how it gets formed is all, all sorts of things. So I've started my companies both ways. I've started companies with two co-founders. Um, my last company was started with two co-founders. I was the CEO, and we had a technologist and a scientist uh, in the founder team. We, we grew a lot from there. Uh, the company before that, I founded on my own. The company I have now, I founded on my own, but brought in an engineer who became our CTO super early on. He's effectively a co-founder. Uh, but the titles don't really mean anything. Um, there is completely an internal thing. So uh, if anything, I think some people can get rewarded by being called a co-founder. So it's a really easy way to compensate somebody. Um, but like giving them a raise, you know, six months, a year into the forming of the company, you go up to them and say, well, I'm not going to give you any more equity or I'll give you a little bit, but I'll also give you the title of co-founder. Uh, again, this takes this, you have to put your ego aside because if, if it's a one founder company, it's a sting to say, oh no, it's co-founders. I'm just a co-founder now. It's kind of a demotion psychologically, but it's, it's worthless. It's, it's, it's just, it's just ego. Um, so yeah, calling somebody a co-founder is a great way to attract really good talent. And again, it costs you nothing. 
Um, yeah. Honestly, giving out equity doesn't really cost anything either because uh, your equity isn't worth jack shit until something big happens. <laughs> so you, you literally get to attract awesome people by paying them nothing, uh, by giving them something that has absolutely no value. And their goal is sure. to make it have value. So yeah, as far as compensating people with equity, for sure, absolutely. Early stage companies should have almost all of their employees compensated with equity, uh, heavily with equity, if not entirely with equity, because cash has value, uh, equity yeah. doesn't. Uh, titles don't have any actual value either. So if somebody, I, my philosophy is if somebody would join you who's an excellent person, they want the title of co-founder, fine. If they want the title of founder and I become an employee, fine. I don't care. I'm not in the king business. I am in the rich business yeah. now. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's that's awesome advice. Um, real quick, too, like I, I wanted to add to your point there. Like I think it's Mark Cuban who always says like it's better to own a, a piece of a watermelon than 100% of a grape or something like that. It's like the same kind of philosophy, right? If you want – in the long term, if your goal is to make your company successful, you know, then, you know, you should – figure out ways to make your company successful. And if that means giving up equity and doing different things and giving people different titles, then that's what you have to do, right? Um, well, to, like, to add on, so, uh, just to add to that, Mark Cuban is an example of an evil VC though. Uh, the reason <laughs> he's saying that is because he wants his investment to make money. So he's mm -hmm. perfectly fine with the founder to taking less of a pay, payout. Uh, right. he's not an entrepreneur. Well, maybe he was at one point, but he's not an entrepreneur. Right. He's an investor yeah. and that's a radically different personality. An investor's interest is very different than an entrepreneur's interest. Yes. He wants you to hire a lot of people and give out a lot of your equity. Um, well, for a lot of reasons, for one, the less equity you have, the less control of the company you have, giving him more control. Um, uh, awesome. but also he wants the company to be successful, but for a different reason. So again, it's 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 the kings of the riches. So there's nothing wrong with being a king, an entrepreneur who wants to be king. People find a lot of fulfillment from running these zombie companies, from running lifestyle businesses that make hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Yeah. I mean, sure. realistically, Ford is one of them, or like the big established companies that have made the United States what it is, is exactly those companies. They have not exited. Uh, they yeah. were just fundamentally sound and they make profits. Again, for an investor, that's not a bad thing. That's not a good thing. For for an entrepreneur, it could be. It really depends on the entrepreneur's personality. Totally. Yeah, I, I also think like it's becoming more and more popular to be a solo founder, right? You can set up an e-com site. You can have a lifestyle business. You can do a blog, a podcast, and this stuff. If you want to build a real comp, like if you want to build a growth company, I think you have to take the things that you were talking about and the advice that you were saying with bringing on people and whatnot, but there's nothing wrong with, you know, having an online business and operating it yourself. If that would, that's what makes you happy. And, you know, you can grow that business. It's just not an investable business at that point though. Um, and a lot of those aren't investable. Um, going, adding to the hiring point and everyone who's, you know, everyone who's watching, get ready to ask questions because we're going to do a Q and A section coming up. Um, we have a question real quick that kind of pertains to the hiring side of things. How how do you we have someone who asked how do you find this type of developer or partner? What were uh, maybe some of the tools resources that you used to actually find these people? Like where did you find your partners? Where did you find your co-founders? Was it just you know relationships? Did you know them previously? How did you meet? How did you meet them? And what's your advice to others for like finding their co-founders or partners? So I've met pretty much all my founders, either co-founders or early employees, but either I knew them already. Uh, and I knew that they had a skill set that might be useful to this company, um, yep. or I met them through networking. Um, I have not used any software tools to do that, although there have been a number, and I'm guessing you're one of them. Uh, but there's there there have been a lot of um, there have been attempts to automate matching. Uh, yep. I haven't personally used any of these tools, although I think they're extremely valuable, especially in today's day. And because right now there's nobody can leave their house anyway. So what the hell? Um, so yes, I, I think uh, developing relationships and rapport uh, with a person is extremely important. I have personally always relied on networking uh, to do that, um, networking or my circle of friends that I had. Um, but yep. yeah, it, it really, again, it's really different for everyone, but the, the idea yeah. is that it's uh, whatever works for you. 
Um, sure. There's no right way to do anything. Uh, there's there's millions of successful companies in the world, and they're all run differently. So if, if you ask, like, what's the right way to do something, there's literally no answer to that. And everybody who gives you an answer and saying it's the right answer, they're full of shit uh, because there <laughs> is no answer um, to all these yeah. questions. So I'm going to just defer by saying, like I will a lot of times, is whatever works for you, uh, whatever yeah, your style that. is. Um, yeah. That. I love that. Yeah, we I interviewed uh, Mike Viscuso. He's the founder of Carbon Black, and they sold recently to, to uh, VMware for over $2 billion. And the first thing that he said was, there are no rules. So whatever I say, take it with a grain of salt. He's like, everyone you can do. Everyone's been successful so many different ways. There's there's you have to figure out what is the best way for you and what is most aligned with who you are and the type of life and lifestyle that you want to live and the type of business and culture that you want to build. So I, I love that advice. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so we're going to get into, we're going to get into questions here in just a minute. Uh, like I said, drop your questions in. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is what we're building here at Ancha. Like we want to make it easy for people to find co-founders, developers, mentors, investors, very much, much easier through our physical events, our online events, and then through our app, through a very, very simple search, um, you can find the right people. Um, I've met all of my, pretty much all of my partners, uh, investors, everyone through events, through our events, through other events. It's, it's insane what has happened in my life the last few years going to events um, and then just networking with people on social media and stuff as well. One thing that I found recently is if you're trying to connect with investors in like the tech and VC scene, a lot of them are on Twitter and they're, they're very, they're much more active on Twitter than any other platform was what I've noticed. Um, most of them do not go on LinkedIn at all um, just because they just get hit up all the time and LinkedIn messages are just completely sales and, and sales driven and, and whatnot. Um, the, the, the one thing that I want to get into before we get into the, the audience Q&A real quick is kind of your current company right now. And, and then also, like, what are what did you do um, and what are your thoughts and advice on finding and building your first uh, customers and your first sales, building your customer base, uh, any like marketing, advertising strategies that you use to get kind of your first sales, your first revenue um, and how did you build out your customer base? Sure. I mean, I think if if you mean by customers, um, I'm gonna re I'm gonna interpret that word. I think a little different than you mean. I think but, if you if customers are the people who give you money, right? So if we define customers like that, so you need to put a hundred dollars in your bank account. Where does it come from? Yep. Right. So let's define customers like that. I think at the early stage of a company, you don't have a product to sell. Right. You're mm -hmm. developing it. You're at the early stages of a company. So that hundred dollars yeah. isn't going to come from people buying your products or your services. Right. Because you have nothing to sell them. What the hell are you going to what the hell are they going to give you money for? Sales or crowdfunding or something. Like that. Right. Yeah. So at the early stages of a company, that hundred dollars is going to come from investors of whatever sort of investors. Yeah. Um, that hundred dollars can come in cash. That hundred dollars can come in services. It can come in employees working for you. Uh, it could be in cash equivalents, it can be in loans, whatever the hell it is. But that $100 isn't going to come from the people buying your products or services. Um, yep. So we, that, those are investors and they come in thousands of different varieties. Um, when you pass that point, so when you already have millions of dollars, and realistically it takes millions of dollars, uh, not necessarily in cash, but in work, in service and whatever to build out a product that you can sell uh, by that time you will have a pretty decent idea of who the customers are um, mm -hmm. because you have been selling at that point in some cases for years when you're developing your first products you're not just shut up in a lab developing products and it, by the way if you are if you have enough cash if you have enough resources to sit at home or in a lab and develop your products and then wait for them to launch you've lost already uh, you're at a huge disadvantage. Uh, not getting feedback from the marketplace for all of those years, not saying, not having potential early employees saying, no, I won't do it, not having investors say, no, I'm not interested. You're at a huge disadvantage. 
And I've actually known right. a lot of people of wealth that have been able to self-fund things um, and then launch just to figure out that nobody actually wants the thing that they're going to be selling. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, by the time you launch, when you by the time you launch your product, you will generally already have been selling for years and years at that point. Um, and your path to market actually becomes pretty clear and who your early customers are. And if it's not, you've been doing it wrong. Um, so I'll just put it that way. And again, the first customers are always different and getting the first customer is always different. It's whatever your style is. You can get your first customers yeah. on Instagram or you can get your first customers at trade shows. Whatever your style is, yeah. whatever your product is, there's no there's no. There's no formula here. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I I like to tell people that are just starting as fast as you can, you have to figure out, does anyone actually even want what I'm building? Yeah. Right. Just getting that early customer data, like if I build this, would you buy it? Right. Or if I built this, would you join it? Like, would you sign up for yeah. it? And just doing like early trials and tests and just getting that early feedback is huge. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, they call it an MVP in the startup world, a minimally yeah, viable product. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, for sure. For sure. I, I love it. Um, okay, great. Um, real quick, right before we get into Q&A, um, everyone drop your questions in. What are your like learning resources? So books, uh, podcasts, any courses videos any people influencers that you follow that people should be learning from where have you gotten educated about business over the years are there any you know best you know places that you go to find knowledge uh no <laughs> love it <laughs> love it you just read the news stay up to date with things how do, how do you stay on top of innovation about, I would say, 99% of the stuff put out, 99% um, of the articles written, the books written, the panels, the experts, the lectures are, are by angels or venture capitalists. Um, mm. They control the conversation. They control the landscape. There's very few non-angel and VCs out there. Uh, and they don't last even if they go out there. And I just generally don't like those people or share their worldview. So I don't listen to them. Uh, so if you talk about trade specific sources of information, like where do I go for my startup gossip? I don't go anywhere. Uh, Cause the people, again, the people who are doing it are the people that I don't agree with their worldview. Uh, as far as the, the big rags, as they say in the industry is TechCrunch is probably one of the biggest one, VentureBeat. Um, there's some other ones, but I'll, I'll hit them randomly and they're generally linked from popular news sites that I'd be reading. So I might be like, reading, I don't know, something on Twitter or CNN, and it might just link to an article on TechCrunch. But it's not like I hit the TechCrunch homepage and start reading gotcha. there. I actually follow some influencers on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn, again, is not a place, you, you, you nailed it. VC are not on LinkedIn. Uh, but a lot of entrepreneurial people are on LinkedIn. Um, Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, is actually a huge anti-VC person. Uh, and coincidentally, a very huge proponent of equity crowdfunding. Um, so he's yeah. he's been on there. He's you know he's shared some thought leadership on it. Um, there there there's there's a lot of there, there's a lot of things I read. I read all the time, hundreds of things a day. Well, no, that's an exaggeration, but I try to read hundreds of things a day about startup stuff. Uh, but very few of it comes from uh, the types of industry gossip sources that you would think. Uh, I just follow popular media for the most part. Sure. sure. Okay. Great. Um, what are your, yeah, Reed Hoffman, he has, Reed Hoffman has a podcast called Masters of Scale too. That's pretty good. Um, he has some pretty powerful people that, that come on there, but yeah, you have to be very careful about who you listen to and everything. That's why we always like to ask, you know, our speakers and stuff. Any just like general business books or personal development books that have helped you over the years? Um, or are you not really a, a book guy? No, I like books. Um, yeah, I've, I've read some books. I recommend my book right here, if I can plug it. The Evergreen. The, well, The Evergreen Startup. What? It's big. But, yeah, The Evergreen Startup. And that's um, on your website, right? It's on my – yeah, it's coming out in a, in a week or so. This is the final proof. Um, I think Miriam I think Miriam posted your site. Yeah, just yeah. Bertoff. Yeah, just my last right? name.com. There, there will be a yes, link to yeah, it. You can sign up. 
Um, I'm going to give people special discounts and rewards for buying it early, uh, things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, so part of my stuff that I do is I teach, uh, entrepreneurship topics at the MIT enterprise forum, which is like a, a part of MIT that deals with entrepreneurship. Um, there, I do recommend some readings to my students. Um, they're, they're good. Um, and uh, I mean, you, you can you can just go online. You can see a, a reading list there. Yeah. Uh, they're fundamentally good things to learn about when you're just starting to think about entrepreneurship. As far as online tools, I always recommend Lean Canvas, which is leanstock.com. It's a free resource. You can go in there and you can fill out what's called the Lean Canvas. It's basically like a structured um, brainstorming activity. And I recommend doing that with someone. Um, yep. There are automated business planning software. By the way, business plans haven't really been used in the startup world for years and years. Nobody actually cares about those. But and yeah. in fact, I've actually heard VC say and angels that if you have a business plan, it's a reason to not invest in the company um, because it shows that you're out of touch and you don't really know what the hell's going on. However, that being said, I've actually always found business plans to be a useful exercise just internally for me. Uh, for sure. I think when I'm writing a lot of the time and it, it kind of makes me introspective about things. So I enjoy it's, it's a tedious process. It's a long process, but I've always found it useful. Um, and as your company is growing, it's good to have a place to copy paste out of because people will keep yeah. asking you questions that you need to answer. It's good to have like a master list of answers to random questions. They can literally you can go into this resource and paste into an email and save you a shitload of That's time. Fun. Um, so I, yeah, and the, the business plan software that I like to recommend is called live plan. Um, yep. it's, a, it's, it's a, it's pretty straightforward. It automates your financial stuff. It walks you through the business planning process. Um, so the, the discipline entrepreneurship toolbox is also a really good resource, uh, for planning and organizing. Uh, it's an, it's an MIT thing, uh, but you can log in. It's free. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a bunch of tools out there which I think are excellent. Uh, for startups and for somebody early stage, I always recommend following them. Um, I think one of the one of the challenges that early stage startups have is they want to break the rules without really knowing what the rules are. Um, so when mm. they just end up going around mm -hmm. in circles and screwing up everything. So I would recommend learning yep. the rules and then breaking them rather than just yep. making shit up and making mistakes. So. Um, you know what they say? They say that everybody learns from mistakes, but the smart ones learn from other people's mistakes. Um, yep. So I, so true. I recommend going in. There's no wrong out there. Everything is wrong anyway. But I would recommend exposing yourself to as much stuff as you can, especially if you're just diving into the world of startups. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's great. That's great advice. We, you know, biz, I think... Um, Business plans are important, but you should not be spending a bunch of time on them at the beginning. It's great to get what's up in your head out on a piece of paper or in a Word document or whatever. But if you're spending months and months creating a business plan, you 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 miss that opportunity to talk to customers and potential you know investors and people about what you're doing and getting feedback and whatnot and even the biggest companies in the world, their business plans and their business models are changing and evolving all the time. So for you to be changing or for you to be spending so much time writing your business plan at the beginning when you have absolutely nothing makes no sense because it's going to change as you're building your company the whole time. Um, so well, a business plan, that, you're right. A business plan is a living document. It's not you write it and you forget it. Uh, but I treat it more not for planning my business, but as a daily diary. It's kind of like a therapeutic yeah. exercise. You have an idea, yeah. write it down. Yes. Um, yeah. And you can do that in a structured way. So basically a business plan has a bunch of sections in it. And whatever your idea fits, put it in there. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, like I said, I don't think it's useful for investors. Uh, when you get a little more mature as a company and you're eligible for loans like SBA loans or other things, they will require a business plan. That's part of their process. Some of the older school angels, um, especially something in an industry called venture philanthropy, uh, this is social impact investing. So people who care about a cause and invest, that industry actually still requires business plans. Uh, but it's not, yeah. it's not, it's not going to hurt you uh, if you want to join some nonprofit accelerator 
Uh, you can, they will require a business plan. So it's not a bad document to have, but yeah, it's definitely not necessary. For sure. For sure. What are your, um, as far as another very popular um, document in the startup space, a pitch deck, what are your, if you have quick pieces of advice um, for people when they're going through their pitch decks or putting together their pitch deck, what is your advice on them um, for that um, before we get into Q&A? Just keep it really easy. And again, it's not when you're pitching, you're not selling, you're making friends. So have a story, be entertaining, um, keep the words down to a minimum. Um, you know, they, an audience member can only do one thing at a time. They can either listen to you or read your slides. And you always just mm. want them to listen to you. Uh, so keep your slides super bare. Uh, tell a story. Uh, and honestly, if something is not on your slides, it doesn't really matter. If they're interested in you, if they like you, they'll ask you. Um, if they, I mean, the point of the slides is not to debrief the audience and everything about your business. The point is to relay enough and show your personality and, and try to make some friends. So don't worry about like the 10 slides and having everything covered. If they're interested, they'll ask you about it. Interesting. Great advice. Okay. I think we have a couple of questions. So there's one from the beginning. Um, someone asked, uh, how do opportunity zones help you raise money or have you gotten into or messed around with opportunity zones or do you, do you have any um, information about opportunity zones? I mean, I'm pretty, I haven't like invested or done anything with them, but uh, I'm aware that there's certain, you know, sections um, of cities that governments are giving discounted um, investment opportunities to and tax uh, benefits to, um, for starting your businesses in those areas. So if you want to speak on that really quickly, if you if you are familiar with it. Yeah, no, I am. Uh, opportunity zones, they come in a lot of different flavors. Um, there's also like free trade zones. And there's, there's a bunch of things that uh, governments do uh, to increase activity. So small businesses, and I'm, I'm not startups, specifically small businesses are the top employer in the United States. Small businesses employ about 65% of the people who are employed in this country uh, not big companies right you so you think like walmart or amazon or something no they don't employ that many people relatively speaking it's small businesses uh, the government yeah. does, defines a small business as any business that's under 500 employees so it's still a big business but they, they call it a small business different story they yeah. those 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 zones and those opportunity zones and things like sba loans and things like that are designed for those. And there's also a thing called the micro business, which is a 50 person or under business. Um, so yes, the communities rely on those for employment. They rely on them. Um, it's, it's very advantageous for a community to give discounts and tax incentives uh, for people to start those businesses and grow those businesses and keep those businesses from going out of business. Uh, because in the long run, that's going to save them a lot of money uh, from social services and healthcare and stuff like that. So you actually see a lot of that right now. So you see the coronavirus making a lot of people lose their jobs, a lot of people, massive amounts of people. So the Congress today. Can you guys still hear me? I'm not sure. Oh, yep. Something just happened. Yeah. Just my oh, yeah. screen went blank. The um, it's, it's back now. So the so you see that exact same thing happening right now. Um. Crazy amounts of people losing their job, crazy amounts of stimulus spending by the government, $2 trillion passed today, it'll, it'll probably pass more. This is all part of the same thing. And by the way, equity crowdfunding also came out of a congressional reform that came out of 2008, which was one of the reasons for these opportunity zones. Uh, so yes, yeah. I think being in an opportunity zone, if you're a specific type of business, uh, is useful. But if you're a high-tech startup, it's not really going to affect you that much. Again, the risk right. profile of somebody investing in a startup or a technology company with an unproven market, an unproven product, unproven team, all those kinds of things. The profile of that investor, yes, they might be more incentivized because of their tax incentives, but the risk profile is so much different than if they were to invest in a pizza shop. Um, right. So yeah, those things are they're good. Uh, they're very good for communities. There should be a lot more of those, uh, but they're primarily tailored for small businesses. And by small business, I mean a tested business model with a tested product at a tested price with tested demand. Like it's the difference between a pizza shop and a pizza ordering app. Uh, pizza shop, you can easily model demand. You can easily model costs, all that kind of stuff. So it's good for those things. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt. Uh, it also, it definitely brings more angel investors uh, into the space just because the cost of investing goes down. Um, but then again, the opportunity zones also tend to be in areas where there's less investment activity, uh, like Kinetic has a very large opportunity zone. And that's largely because they want to increase investment activity, not because they already have a lot of investment activity. Um, so, I mean, it kind of comes out in the wash. If you're in an area that is an opportunity zone and you're, you have connections there and that's where your business is, great. Uh, if you're thinking of moving to an area like that, uh, that's probably not the best idea because just moving to an area where there's more investment happening in general is probably going to lead to investment much more uh, readily than moving to an area specifically for their opportunity zones. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, what's your... So we have another question here. What are your thoughts on and recommend uh, for people going through maybe an opportunity to have an early acquisition? Um, or do you think they should continue to build their startup and, and grow their startup um, organically? Um, what are your thoughts on maybe getting early offers? Like obviously, you know, Instagram sold way too Instagram sold way too early or for some respects and others, obviously they got some help from Facebook. Um, so a lot of companies, you know, they get these offers, you know, should they take them? Should they not? What are your thoughts on, on companies, um, you know, maybe having offers or, you know, early acquisitions? I was speaking to somebody who recently signed a record deal. Uh, well, a couple of years ago, they signed a record deal with cash money records, which is like a hip hop label. Uh, they did good. They got a bunch of money, uh, but their records are selling a lot now, a lot. And the terms right. of the of the record deal is that they got paid very little. So for every every you know download, every metric, they get paid a fraction, a tiny little amount. So the conversation basically went like this: If I hadn't published, if I hadn't given my rights to this label who did all the promotion, uh, I would have gotten a lot more money. But would I have gotten a lot more? Would I have been as popular if I haven't given the rights to this label? Exactly. So yep. the question, and it's it's similar, right? So um, Snapchat or Insta or whatever, right? Yes, they sold, they sold, and I actually think Insta sold for a ridiculous amount of money from where they were, but doesn't matter. Um, would they have been as big as they were as they are now if they did not sell? Uh, right. My assumption is that they would not have been. Uh, the reason that they're as big as they are now is because they did sell. So, no, I think if there's money on the table, you should probably take it. Uh, it's much more common for people if they refuse offers is that no other offers are made and they fail. So, yes, I, as a general rule, rule in life, I think if somebody's giving you money, you should take the money. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's caveats, and you kind of have to think rationally about this. But every company is worth exactly what it's worth at the moment that is being offered the money, not in the future, not in the past. Like people ask me because I have a financial background. People ask me if they should invest in airline stocks right now, right, or travel industry stocks or Carnival Cruise Line stock, right? So as you can imagine, Carnival Cruise Line stock is worth nothing. Right. Yeah. So people come up to me and say, well, do you think it's a good time to buy Carnival Cruise Line stock? And I say, well, you know what? There's a lot of smart people selling it and there's a lot of smart people buying it. Like always, it's always 50 50, whether it's actually worth more now uh, than it will be in the future, just because that's how the market works. So, no, I can't recommend you buy or sell any stock at any time because the market is setting the right price right now. So the, the fact that, that somebody asked the question, is this a good time to buy, is ignoring every set of data that there is that says that this is not ever a good time to buy stock. Um, because, again, every time you buy, it's 50-50 because the market has already set the price. So, yes, I think if you want to sell your company early on, it's 50-50 if you're making the right decision or not. But generally, mm -hmm. having a million bucks in the bank is better than not having a million bucks in the bank. Sure. So if you get an offer and it's a decent offer and it can make you happy and you can move on to your next thing, take the offer. Right. Yeah, I think I think that's great advice because you don't know. I mean, you can't predict the future. Right. If you have a really good, um, you know, feeling and, and you really see the potential in what you're building and, you know, you, you want to stick it out and whatnot, then yes, um, you can go ahead and do that. But if you look at like the what's, what's 
app founder selling for 19 billion to Facebook, he did not want to do that. But he realized the decision was much bigger than him and he can change the lives of all of his employees and his investors that were involved. So that's why he, they made the decision um, to, to sell to Facebook. So I think there's, as you grow too, there's different things, there's different circumstances that come into play as well that you have to consider and weigh the options with too. Um, but yeah, fantastic. Okay, we have another question from Cameron here. What advice do you have around where young entrepreneurs should consider living, networking, and building their startups? Um, so this is people in high school, college. Uh, should young entrepreneurs go to college? Do you think that they should uh, work for a startup, live together with other people? Should they go live at home? What do you recommend? I, it depends on your style. Again, I, I some people thrive in that kind of environment. If you're if you want to hang out with people who are doing startups, you should do that. See if you like the culture or not. Um, again, it depends on the person. I mean, I know people who are crazy antisocial and they don't like hanging out that have massively successful companies, uh, but they've never hung out with startups because they don't care about that. That's kind of not the clique that they're hanging out in. Although they're leaders in the startup world, it's just they don't hang out with startups. Just like, you know, there's actors who don't make it onto the front page of every news source every time, that there's no gossip about them, that they're not on Instagram, but they're massively successful actors. So there's plenty of entrepreneurs that are not like part of the entrepreneurial world. Um, so it, it, again, it depends on your style. If you want to be a, a startup groupie and hang out with all the startup cool kids, fine, do <laughs> that, it works for you. Then you'll, you'll see if you like the startup world. Uh, but it shouldn't yeah. prevent you from starting something up. So if you want to start something up and you don't like startup people, that's fine. You don't need to hang out with them. Actors don't need to hang out with other actors. Um, yeah. So I, I, would, I would give you that advice. You don't have to live in a place where there's a lot of startups. Uh, you don't have to hang out with startups if you don't want to. But if you do want to, if that's your thing, um, if you want to be on the front cover of every gossip magazine and that's, that's how you become mm -hmm. famous and that's how you keep your fame, Fine, that's your style. So again, no rules, uh, just whatever you kind of want to do. Um, if you want, if, if your goal is to see if you like that, if you like the startup world, the world that you see on TV, by the way, startup world isn't what you see on TV, but if you want to see, if you want to kind of experience the TV thing, move to an area or visit an area for a long period of time that has a lot of this stuff. Uh, and more often than not, you'll either love it or you'll hate it. But again, when you're actually doing startups, you don't have to be a part of that world. I mean, it's more like tourism. Like if you want to see monkeys running around naked, throwing their feces at each other, yes, go to San Francisco. You'll see a lot of startup monkeys throwing feces at each other. Every Starbucks you go to, if they ever have Starbucks again, uh, you will see that. Uh, but again, startups are not that. You don't have to be part of that clique to have a startup. Um, yeah. So it really is whatever your style is. Yeah, love it. All right. I think that's pretty much it. Um, if you guys have any final, final questions real quick, uh, drop them in right now. Um, we're going to also open back up the networking. So for everyone on, if you guys want to, right after we're done here, you can jump into the networking section and FaceTime with the other attendees. Um, and we'll be you know live for another I think it's going to go on till 830. So there's still some time if you guys want to network with each other and hang in. Um, but we'll we'll let Mike go. Thank you so much. That was incredible. You dropped some some real knowledge. I hope everyone was paying attention. You had your notebooks out. Um, if you want to connect with with Mike, uh, we have I, I just dropped in his LinkedIn, um, his website also, and then his book is coming out. So if you want, you know, we can drop in a, a link, and we'll make sure we include it too. If you Mike, if you send us the link, we'll include it in the thank you email for tomorrow. So you guys can get his book at a discount. Um, final pieces of advice, any words to live by, any anything, final thoughts for our, you know, young founders, growing founders, early stage startups. Um, what are your final pieces of advice for everybody? Just do it. Don't think too much about it. Love it. Simple. That's, that's one thing that I noticed. You've been, everything's been very simple, like... That, that you've gone through. Uh, I think it's great advice. Um, and I think, you know, starting companies is, you know, it, it's a lot of trial and error and, you know, just continuing to put one step in front of the other. 
But Mike, thank you so much for being a part of this, um, and sharing your story. We really enjoyed it. Um, like I said, everyone check him out, connect with him. He's an incredible person to know, use him, like don't use him, but like, you know, use this opportunity to connect with him, should I say, um, and, and make sure that, that you uh, connect with us, stay in touch with us. We have a couple of great events next week. Um, we are doing an event Monday with David Meltzer. We're doing an event on Wednesday with a partner at Bessemer Ventures um, VC. So we'll have an interview like this with an investor next week. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of these virtual events. So thank you to everyone for joining. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, you know, we're really focused on helping all of you guys connect with each other and, and build startups and build your companies easier and faster. If you guys want to jump in and join uh, beta for the app, you can just go on the website, um, joinantra.com, follow us on social at joinantra, um, jump into the app, which we're going to be rolling out here uh, very soon, and you'll be able to, to meet everybody. But that's it. Um, we'll let Mike go. I'm going to stop this. You guys can continue into the networking section if you want to meet some of the other um, some of the other attendees. But thank you guys so much. Stay safe out there. Stay healthy. Um, hope everyone's families and friends are doing okay. And, you know, we really appreciate you guys being in our community. Um, we'll send you guys links to the upcoming events um, that are going on next week as well. Uh, and just thank you for being a part of our community. Thanks, guys. Talk to you. See ya.